David Pierce, known as Lucky, to his fellow squadmates, has been with the XCOM project since its inception in 1999. He has fought aliens with only some second grade military fatigues to protect him. He was overjoyed when he received his first laser rifle, his first plasma gun, and he likes nothing better than lining up his blaster launcher to deal untold unholy death through the alien Ghibli hordes. And he has seen many friends die. He has seen them blasted apart by, by plasma fire from sectoids and mutons, and seen them eaten by chrysalids, and had other horrible fates <laughs> dealt to them. But David Pierce is lucky. David Pierce is a survivor. Many of the recent recruits to the XCOM project think he has a thing for the other long-term survivor, Evelyn Hill. But while they are friends, while they do share many memories and commiserate many lost comrades, uh, there is no romantic chemistry between them. David Pierce is a dedicated family man, and Evelyn Hill is a career soldier, poster girl, for England's new military and opposing the alien menace. Now, if, well, you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about a game called XCOM UFO Defense from 1994, Microprose. It is, the best word to describe it, would be a base management simulator with a survival horror combat system built into it. Because you manage the space and manage the XCOM project to repel the evil aliens and frequently send out your squad troopers to die. And die they will. For XCOM UFO Defense is a brutal, unforgiving game. Make a step in the wrong direction, an alien will shoot you and you'll die. Or an alien will run out from behind a building, throw a grenade at your squad, and they will all die. Death is cheap. Death comes very quickly. And yet, if you talk to fans of the game, myself included, you will find that we have built this narrative about the exploits of the poor doomed squad members who are sent out time and time again to fight the alien hordes. Why do we do this? Well, we do this because we are storytelling beings. Um, as the overseeing commander of these poor doomed fools, we imagine stories about who this luckless trooper is, who that luckless trooper is. Why did she join this elite fighting force for 60% casualty rate? I mean, who does that? What sort of person? And if you happen to be like David Pierce, maybe you have survived. What sort of person would that be like? And of course, the person behind the computer game playing it thinks these things. And so that is the basis of today's topic. Narrative in role-playing games, which don't apparently seem to support it. Well, you know, those games, games like Dungeons and Dragons, RuneQuest, Rollmaster, to a lesser extent Traveller, since it had its old background generation system. But many of the old school games had no context for narrative, for how to develop your character's personality, or how they would interact socially with other people. Now, this was largely because the designers of those games in those times thought, well, you're not fools. You know how interactions with people work. You say these weird mouth noises, they say these weird mouth noises back. When you come to an accord, you know how to do deals and make make friends and talk to people you've what even if you have not gone someone or seduced someone or you know, got someone to charge that hill you've seen movies where that has happened you can describe it you don't need mechanics for that you know how that works you can do it but we'll throw in these rules of combat because well combat's weird and confusing and Horrible and uncertain. And that's what the rules are for. They have to resolve uncertainties that you can't decide. 
much role playing is very much like playing cowboys and Indians, cops and robbers from childhood. Except that when both of you leap up and say bang bang, well, there are rules to decide who falls down dead, and who gets injured, who gets winged, what happens. And so that's why many older games are combat heavy, because, well, we're not familiar with combat, so we need something to simulate that. But with everything else, we can pretty much simulate in our heads, we can do that. But the example from the XCOM game, a game with absolutely, well, this is teeny tiny narrative, they're aliens. They're invading. You need to defeat them. Uh, yep, that's it. <laughs> that really is the story. <laughs> oh, you go to Mars. There you go. That's the entire AUFO XM Defense story. That's all there is. Um, but people form ideas around it. Their stories evolve from it. You know, what do people do with the chrysalids in the tank once they've captured them and brought them back? You know, how does everyone feel about their particular gun? Are they good with a particular gun? Are you going to give... You know, do you suddenly have that, decide that your XCOM project has rules, such as a rookie is not allowed to touch an energy weapon until they get promoted? There's no rules for that in the game. There's no rules which disallow a rookie being given an, an expensive energy weapon, except that eventually you'll learn not to give rookies expensive energy weapons, because energy weapons are expensive. Rookies are cheap. Therefore, you do not give rookies energy weapons. They just go out there and they somehow survive. Then they are allowed something which is expensive and is tanked in time and effort to produce, rather than just going to the available roster and clicking on we want some more warm bodies button. Because in the XCOM UFO defense, there is a we need more warm bodies buttons. And warm bodies are cheap. Cheap. Really cheap. Scientists are expensive. Well, elite warriors are. You can find them anywhere. But, you know, in these older games, there is no need for narrative rules. Because you supply the narrative. And there is no need to put them in because... You're going to supply the narrative, whether there are rules or a narrative, whether there is narrative provided or intended or even dreamed of. The narrative just happens. Humans are a storytelling species, after all. Thank you.